you need to look over the top of them unless you're all blurred. But if, if not, th oh, well, that's blurred. So there we go. They're in the right place now. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, a little topic, God's dwelling places. We're going to look at six different uh, ways that God dwells, and uh, two from the Old Testament and four from the New Testament. We look at three this week and three next week. But what we're going to see is there's a movement and there's a development. The Lord uh, begins to dwell in a place, but there's a movement to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then to a people, those who believe in Jesus. And that is as God takes up his dwelling in the tabernacle, but then the movement to tabernacling in Jesus and then tabernacling in the heart of the believer. And the psalmist says, O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. So where God dwells, there is his presence, there is his glory, and there is something beautiful to behold. The Shekinah glory that manifested at times, that came down upon the people with such power and such weight that they fell face down. And there's times in as the people of God congregate that that still happens today, isn't it? The weight and glory of God comes down as he begins to dwell and lets his glory fill his people. Then another scripture from Deuteronomy, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. So there's an encouragement to the people of God, that's Israel, to pursue, to seek out, to visit, to go on pilgrimage, if you like, to the Lord's dwelling place. Now the Lord started out dwelling on the mountain, didn't he? Mount Sinai. As he brought them out of Egypt. But then we see a movement in a moment. We're going to see he took up residence in the tabernacle. And then the third uh, scripture here. Well, but what we know is scripture encourages if we seek and seek with all our hearts, then we will find. So if the Lord tells us to seek, then it makes sense for us to be obedient and to do it. Because if we seek him, we will find him. And if we seek out the place where he dwells, we will find his presence and his glory, his life and his peace and his joy. In the presence, in your presence is fullness of joy, the psalmist tells us. And then from Exodus, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So the dwelling place of the Lord here is referred to as the sanctuary. And when we think of sanctuary, we think of peace, we think of calm, we think of tranquility, we think of holiness, don't we? The translations, the different ways you can translate that word sanctuary are holy place, so God dwells. In the sanctuary, God dwells in the holy place. Where God dwells is a holy place. The hallowed part, the sacred space, or the consecrated place. And where does God dwell now? By his Holy Spirit. Which we're going to look at in a lot more detail next week. God dwells in the heart of Because of the sacrifice of Jesus and because of the indwelling spirit, God takes up his dwelling place 
in the heart of man. A holy place. A consecrated place. A sacred space. And a hallowed place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, the dwelling place of God. So God's dwelling places in the Old Testament predominantly were the tabernacle and the temple. And what we find with the tabernacle, which came as the people of Israel wandered around the wilderness, God delivered them from the slavery of Egypt through the Exodus and through the pillar of cloud in the day and fire at night. He manifested his presence amongst them. He protected them from the enemy. He, he stood between Egypt and Israel as Pharaoh uh, closed in and then opened the sea and they passed through. And the pillar of fire uh, and cloud stayed with them. And then it was revealed to Moses to build the tabernacle. And in that they put uh, various things. There were various different places in it. Um, under the tent there, you've got the holy place and the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, you've got the ark of the covenant. And uh, the idea is God is dwelling in that place. And of course, we know that uh, Moses would frequently visit the tabernacle and speak to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But the key thing here is this is God dwelling, tabernacling, tenting it in the midst of his people. Because the tabernacle was placed right in the middle of the camp and the Israelite tribes were assigned a place, east, west, north and south. I, I can't remember, three in each, but I can't remember what order they were in now. But east, west, north and south around the tabernacle with God in the midst of his people. And the Lord moved with his people. So God moving with his people. They would camp, set up the tabernacle, and they would wait until the pillar of cloud or fire moved, and then they would take down the tabernacle and they would follow pillar of fire and or cloud whether it was night or day they would be ready to move so a, a nomadic people a moving people but God in the midst of his people and moving with his people and it's here that um, as the Lord had spoken to Moses up on the mountain that the regulations and rituals for worship and sacrifice were put in place a sinful people Approaching a holy and awesome God. So the people couldn't go right up to the presence of the Lord. Um, we see that right from Mount Sinai, don't we? The people had to stay off the mountain because the presence of God would have consumed them because of their sin. But through the tabernacle and God dwelling in the tabernacle, we're beginning to see that there's an issue in the heart of man that needs dealing with if man is to be in a relationship with God. There's sin in the heart of man. And a sacrifice is required to deal with that sin. They had to offer regular sacrifices, uh, but that was because the sin remained in their hearts. But this was looking forward to a day when the one ultimate and eternal Sacrifice would be offered by Jesus upon the cross to deal with the presence and power of sin once and for all and to open up a way for man to come into God's presence without limitations and without restrictions. So the tabernacle, God in the midst of his people. And as the Israelites became established in the land, then the tabernacle um, was put in a um, permanent place. And in David's day, something very, very significant happened. 
David established something called the Tabernacle of David. And it's something that's picked up in the New Testament. Remember the Council of Jerusalem, where they are deciding how are they going to find a way for Jewish and Gentile Christians to live together. And James comes back with some scripture that's inspired them and provided instruction for the way forward. And he quotes this passage of scripture about the tabernacle of David. It's from Amos, um, Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, and it's quoted in Acts 15 and 16. And that what David did was he offered the sacrifice as the king, whereas it was the priests that should have offered the sacrifices, and everybody was welcome to come into the tabernacle. There was none of the restrictions, and only the priests could go in. And what it was, it was a shadow and a pointer that in and through Jesus, a tabernacle of David was going to exist forever. There would be no separation between God and the worshiper. And anyone and everyone could come and offer sacrifices of praise. You didn't just have to be a priest. That's, one, that's the key verse from Amos that's carried into the New Testament, all about this tabernacle of David. But as the tabernacle was uh, in the land, uh, David had it in his heart to, David had built an incredible palace as the kingdom of Israel was established. And David had built this incredible palace. And uh, he said, how can I live in a palace? And you're living in a, a little tent. Uh, let me build a house for you. And the Lord says, how can I dwell in a house? God didn't really want to dwell in a house because he's looking to dwell in a heart. And, uh, but he agrees that uh, a house, the temple, can be built. Uh, but David can't build it because he's a man of war and there's blood on his hands. And all the instructions and all the preparations David are al is allowed to put in place. And Solomon builds it in his day. And in and through the temple, what we see is the Lord in the midst of worship. The Lord in the midst of a worshipping people. But in some, well, what we do see for sure is that this separation, this regulation, this ritual becomes more established. The problem of sin is being pointed out even more. Because you have gates, you have courts, you have the holy place and the holy of holies. Now, the holy of holies, only one person can go in, and that's once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest can go in to offer a sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the people of Israel. And he would go in and he'd have bells on the bottom of his uh, robe, because so, as he's moving around, they can hear him. They can know he's still alive. He'd have a rope tied to him just in case he died, and they'd have to pull him out. Um, serious stuff. Uh, man approaching a holy God. Then you'd have the holy place where the priests and the Levites would minister, but only they could go there. Then you'd have the court of Israel. And only the men of Israel could go there. And then you'd have the outer courts. And the women and children could go there. And then you'd have the court of the Gentiles. So we see this separation all the way through. But in the midst of it, God is there in the midst of worship. And as the sacrifice is offered. And God is dwelling in the holy of holies. And what is referred to above the ark on the mercy seat. But here you see the people moved to worship the Lord. The temple was in Jerusalem. And obviously people lived all around the land. And three times a year for the great festivals, they would travel up to Jerusalem. And they would ascend up the mount. Uh, as they passed over the Mount of Olives, they then ascend up to Jerusalem. And they would sing the Psalms of Ascent, which we see in the book of Psalms. Uh, their joy their exuberance, their expectation as they're going up to worship the Lord. So we had God in the midst of the people and God moving with his people. Now we have God in the midst of the worship and the people moving to be with God. There's a both and. 
and we're going to see that as we move forward. Then as we move into the New Testament, the uh, temple got uh, destroyed. Uh, it was rebuilt in the days of Herod the Great, uh, but it wasn't as uh, glorious, people thought, as it was before. But obviously the promises of Scripture that God is building an even more glorious temple, that wasn't going to be a uh, brick and uh, uh, structure or brick and wood structure. That was going to be uh, the church. Uh, and in Jesus, as Jesus is born, what we find is God dwells in a man. All of the promise as Jesus is coming, uh, made to Mary, and we see it, uh, we look at it at Christmas a lot, don't we? Emmanuel, God with us. Here is God in the midst of his people in dwelling in a man, dwelling in his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, but dwelling with all the limitations of humanity. And John 1.14 says, God dwelt amongst us. Or God, the message translation puts it, God moved into the neighborhood. Other translations put it, God tabernacled with us. So here's God tabernacling with men in and through Jesus. And the early church fathers, Irenaeus and a couple of others, uh, used to teach, he became like us so that we might become like him. God became a man to deal with this problem of sin. Here is Jesus tabernacling. Here is God tabernacling in Jesus. Jesus, the one who said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. They thought Jesus was talking about the physical temple with these huge blocks of stone. How can you destroy this and rebuild it in three years when it's taken over 40 years or so to build it? Jesus is referring to the temple that is his body. We find that in uh, John 2 and verse 19 and in the other Gospels as well. So in Jesus, we find the idea of tabernacle and temple come together. And John um, 14, uh, is it John? The beginning of John 14, uh, where Jesus talks about he's going away, but I go to prepare a room for you. Now the temple, uh, the built temple, had the courts, but uh, around the walls there were lots of rooms. So this is temple language that Jesus is using. Jesus, who is the one who tabernacles with us, God with us, but Jesus also, who is the temple of God. God is dwelling in the heart of a man. And Jesus, who came to offer that once and forever perfect sacrifice, the great high priest of our faith, who at the same time is the sacrifice, is God tabernacling with us and is the temple. God in the midst of the people and God uh, offering himself on behalf of the people. The mercy seat. The mercy of God revealed in and through our lovely Lord Jesus. Through the death and resurrection of Christ, salvation and eternal life are made available. The resurrection power can come and empower our lives through the Holy Spirit. Jesus has done it all. God has done it all. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But it requires a response on our behalf. One believes in the heart and confesses with the mouth unto salvation that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. So there's a twofold process. There's a belief in the heart and a confession with the mouth.
And today is the day of salvation. If you've never done that, you can know Jesus as Lord and Savior today. And people can be available to lead you through that process and pray with you. And in and through God tabernacling with humanity through Jesus, through Jesus who was the temple of God, the place where the sacrifice was going to be made, the place where obedience of worship would be offered in fullness. As Jesus died upon the cross, what happened? The veil of the temple, the thing separating the people and the priests from the holy presence of God was torn in two. Not so that people can go in, because God has left the temple. God no longer le- needs to live in a particular place in Jerusalem, because God has taken up residence in Jesus. And in and through Jesus, God can take up residence in every heart that would submit unto him. We're going to look at that more next week. So we see this movement from dwelling in a place to indwelling in the heart of man. That's something worth meditating and reflecting on as you go through this week. Now my friend Alan over there, you ask him how he is, he always says, I'm lovely. And you know what? He's right. Can I tell you why he's right? And he might look lovely. But he's lovely, and you are lovely. Because the psalmist says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Psalm 88, verse 1. How lovely, beautiful, magnificent, beloved. Translate it all that way. How beloved is your dwelling place, Lord God of hosts. You are beloved by God who dwells in your heart. So every time he says, I'm lovely, he's absolutely 100% right. So don't laugh at him, just say yes. Man, the dwelling place of God. Isn't that incredible that God desires to dwell in your heart and my heart. He has done everything that is necessary to accomplish that, but he will not force his way upon us. He can only take up residence. He can only come and tabernacle. He can only come and begin to establish that temple of the Holy Spirit as I invite him in to recognition and acceptance of Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. I'm looking out at a lot of lovely places this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your deepest desire is to tabernacle and dwell in the hearts of your people. We thank you that through our wonderful, our magnificent, our Savior Jesus, you have made this possible. Thank you that you make each one of us lovely and we are beloved of you, O Lord. May we know your presence and your fullness of joy in our hearts. This we ask through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name.